In this segment, we're going to talk about memory types and technologies from the very first PC to the present. Now, having been involved with PCs since the very first one came out, I've seen memory change tremendously over the years, and I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at all the different types of memory that we've had available, and in some cases to see, um, you know, the, the physical, uh, how, you know, how it appeared, what it cost, and that sort of thing. Now, going back to 1981, when the very first IBM PC came out, you didn't have very many choices when it came to buying memory for the system. Uh, and, and initially, you had this choice right here. This was a 64K memory card that was available from IBM, 64 kilobytes of memory. And at the time, this cost a whopping $540. See, back then, nine 16K chips, which is what it took to make up six, uh, uh, 16K, to, uh, cost $100. And this actually has 36 chips on it. They're double stacked. There's two, uh, two sets of chips from what you see here. So there's $400 in just these chips alone. And these chips ran uh, 200 nanoseconds, which is about 5 megahertz in speed, which, of course, matched the speed of the PC at the time. Then, a year later, we had this uh, card become available. This was a 64 slash 256K card. This could hold four times the amount of memory as the first card here. And what we had was, this would have banks of 64K chips. We had one, two, three, and then four banks of chips here. Normally, this card would sold with just 64K on it, and then you would manually add the rest of the chips. Back then, what we had to do was buy chips. They usually were sold in, you know, in these little uh, tube-like containers, and you would take the individual chips out of the container, like this. This is uh, one of the memory chips. We'd load it into a memory insertion tool, like this, and then you would use this tool and put it over the socket and then press down and push the chip into the socket using this tool. As you can imagine, it would take, uh, you know, quite some time. I remember spending hours filling boards like this. I mean, look at the number of chips on this board. Think of how long that would take to make sure you got each one in, it had, you had to have each one properly oriented, not miss any of the holes. And if you did, boy, you had all kinds of troubleshooting to go through. Well, okay. Um, so we went from 1981 to 82. Then over here, I'm jumping up to 1985 with this card. This card came out after the IBM AT uh, came out. And uh, at the time, this card cost a whopping $475. Now, the good thing was that this card had up to 2 megabytes of memory on it. So we went from uh, 64K to 256K to 2 megabytes. And for the two megabytes, of course, when you consider it was still about $500, the price per K had come down quite a bit. Now, after, after this, after 1985, that was when we started to get away from memory cards. You know, if you look at these cards, you'll note that they actually plugged into bus slots on the motherboard. Back then, the motherboards had very limited memory expansion, and when you wanted to add memory, you had to buy a memory card. The problem with these memory cards is that they were limited to the speed of the, of the bus in the system. And oftentimes, even though the processor and other components on the motherboard were running faster and faster, the, memory, or the, uh, uh, the bus slots had to stay the same speed because cards had to be designed to work with them. So this was a very limiting in, in terms of performance. Well, in 1986, uh, we had the first SIMs come out, and the first type were these 30-pin single inline memory modules. That's what SIM stands for. And the term single inline means that it's really one row of connectors here. You see a row of connectors on this side and a row of, you know, contacts on this side. Even though there are contacts on both sides, they are uh, the same. They're redundant. Now, this particular 30-pin SIM holds 256K of memory. That's the same as this card here. So when you think about it, all of these chips are replaced by just three chips on this uh, tiny little board. That was progress at the time. Well, from the 30-pin SIMs, we went to the 72-pin SIMs here. This is an example of a 72-pin SIM. This one happens to hold 8 megabytes. That's four times more than this entire card in just this little memory module. Now, back then, these modules ran at uh, 5 megahertz for this. This the board ran at 10. And these modules here ran up to 16 um, uh, megahertz. That was the top speed of, uh, available for memory at the time. Well, we had a breakthrough in memory when uh, this type of module came out. This is known as a DIM, and the type of memory that goes on this DIM is called DD. Uh, I'm sorry, it's called um, 
SDRAM, synchronous DRAM. And synchronous, uh, the synchronous was important because that meant it ran in sync with the motherboard. This stuff was available at speeds up to 133 megahertz, which matched the speeds of the motherboards and the chipsets at the time. Now, the uh, SDRAM was popular between 1998 and 2002, and it replaced these 72-pin SIMs here. So from 1998 to 2002, we had a lot of systems using uh, this SDRAM. Now, starting in 2002, that was replaced by something called DDR SDRAM. The DDR stands for Double Data Rate, and just as it's just as the you know, name suggests, it ran twice as fast as the single data rate. So these modules were different. They were not interchangeable, different uh, set of contacts. And uh, these were also DIMMs, being that the memory contacts were on both sides, and they were different. So now we had twice as many contacts without having to have the module be uh, much longer. So this is the uh, DDR DIMM. After DDR, we had DDR2. Now DDR2 came out in 2005 and was popular all the way up until 2008, 2009. We're still using DDR2 today, but it's being replaced today by DDR3. Now, looking at the DDR2, that memory ran up to 1,066 megahertz. So that you know kept pace with the motherboards and chipsets at the time, up until um, you know we needed something faster. So what happened was uh, from DDR2. We go to DDR3 memory, and that's the current state of the art that we're using today. DDR3 came out in 2008, but in late 2009, it started to become really popular. And that was when the price of the DDR3 equaled about the price of the DDR2. Now, when you look at uh, prices of memory, it's uh, pretty amazing. This uh, DDR3 module that I have here costs uh, only $40, and that's 2 gigabytes of RAM. Two gigabytes for forty dollars. I did some math, and putting that into 1981 terms, to buy that much memory in 1981 would cost over eight million dollars. That's how much the price of memory has come down. It's pr pretty amazing. So these days, if you're uh, you know buying or building a PC, in most cases it's going to use DDR2 or DDR3 memory. With most likely the switchover is now happening very rapidly to DDR3. Now let's take a look at a little bit, you know, uh, how this uh, technology works. We mentioned that the double data rate, you know, ran at twice the data rate of the of the uh, uh, single data rate modules. Now DDR2 is not again double the is is not like a, a quadruple data rate. What they did there was they added extra signal pins in order to improve integrity. So the speed, the clock could go higher. We could go up to 1,066 megahertz. With the DDR3, we're up to 1,600. Uh, megahertz with these. And in the future, they may even go faster. So most of the modern motherboards today will use DDR3. That's uh, with the uh, Core i series from Intel and the Phenom processors from AMD. Now, um, when you're installing memory, probably the biggest thing you have to look out for is plugging the memory in, in uh, either backwards or not fully inserted into the slot. And I wanted to point out, uh, here I have an example of a memory module that I took out of a uh, system. And if you look here, I can see two pins where the gold has actually been literally burned off the module. That's because the person who installed these either didn't ensure that they were fully seated, fully inserted into the, into the socket, or they plugged them in backwards. Now, to prevent plugging in backwards, you'll find keying uh, in the form of a notch on the module, which must match the notch on the socket. Now, sometimes this can be confusing. For example, in the case of the DDR2 and the DDR3, they both have the same number of pins. They're both 240 pins, so yet they're in, incompatible with each other. How do you make sure that you know you, th the right memory goes into the right socket and in the right orientation. Well, if you notice, the notches on the DDR2 and the DDR3 are in different positions. So by altering the position of these notches, these keyways, they try to make sure that you, know, you can't plug it in backwards. But even with you know notches like this, I still come across uh, burnt memory pins uh, fairly frequently uh, when people try to install memory and they don't know exactly what they're doing. So. In any case, when you are installing memory, take care to make sure it's fully inserted in the socket and that it's in the right orientation. 
Well, I hope you've enjoyed this look at uh, PC memory types and technologies throughout the years.